episode number 13, Our Man Compache 70.3 with Matt Hansen. Welcome to the pursuit of the perfect race. My name is Terry Wilson, and with each episode, I bring athletes to you that share their experiences at races in order for you to find your perfect race. We will hear stories from athletes of all ages, abilities, and races of all distances. So regardless of where you fit in, there's something in it for you. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now let the pursuit begin. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of The Pursuit to the Perfect Race. Today, I have the opportunity to talk with Matt Hansen, professional triathlete. He just got done racing Ironman 70.3 Campeche, Mexico. And today, we're going to be talking about his race. Welcome to the show, Matt, and I look forward to talking about your race. Thanks for having me. What made you want to do this race in the first place? Uh, well, a couple things, I guess. Um, it's the first 70.3 in North America of the year, uh, so just... I've got some important races early in the season, so I wanted to race and just knock some rust loose after winter training. Um, I did the race last year, and it really did not go well for me, so I wanted to go down and just try to put together a little bit of a better race as well. What went wrong last year? Um, I had some bike mechanical issues, unfortunately. It just didn't battle through them very well. Um, I had a fine swim and a good run, but I just didn't have the bike that I wanted after yeah, some issues that just – you know, it's hard. I, I didn't, I, my, my brake was rubbing a little bit. It just kind of hurt the entire day. Yeah. So with this year, was it a lot different in terms of just an overall day in comparison to last year to this year? Oh, um, yeah, I still didn't bike very well. <laughs> um, but I, uh, that one, this time it, it was a hundred percent on me. Yeah. Overall, I, I finished a little bit better. I swam better and did end up biking a little bit better as well. Than last year, um, I still had the best run of the day, um, but I was a little bit slower than last year. So you know, overall, I was you know it was it was a good day, um, not not a perfect day, but the first race of the season rarely, rarely is. Right. So this race was on March 18th. How did you actually get down to the race? Because you live in the states, right? Yeah, I live in Iowa. Um, I flew out of Des Moines. I usually don't do that, but I flew out of Des Moines this year um, on the 15th on Thursday. I flew down to Merida, which is about two, a two-plus-hour drive away from Campeche. So I flew into Merida. It's, it, it's a three. I had a two-layover flight, three sections to get down there. Um, and then I ended up staying overnight in Merida and then driving to Campeche on the morning of the 16th. Yeah, then coming home was the same. I had to drive to Merida after the race and then stayed in Merida that evening and then had an early flight. I think I flew out on the 19th on Monday morning at 6 a.m. and I got back home at about 2 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Wow. So it's definitely not a easy place to get to. Man, so what kind of bike case did you use? I used a Rooster Hen House. I've used that for a number of years to to save money on travel costs, but I am I quickly learned that that doesn't work well now with the new disc brakes that I have um, because of the way the front disc or the the I used to be able to just completely take off the fork with my PR6 or with the QR PR6 before, but with the PR6 disc, the uh, brake cable runs through the fork. Uh, instead of just being separate from it, and so it it that that case didn't work well, um, so I, I'll be having to go another option for future travels. Are you gonna look into a bike case where you don't really have to take it all the way apart? Um, taking it apart is no problem, but the the problem was um, it just didn't fit into the case once I did take it apart because of how the fork set on the frame. I actually on the way home. I tried to do the best I could in protecting it on the way there, and then TSA repacked it, and they packed my, uh, and they took some of the padding that I had off, and the fork was rubbing on the crank, which made yeah, it left. And this was a brand new bike; literally, I had never rode it outside, <laughs> and so it scratched up the the fork a little bit, and so I actually had to pull the crank on the way home. 
and put that in my wheel bag. So um, I'm not going to do that every time I travel. So we'll have to find another another option. But I'll uh, be able to speak more about that one in a, in a few weeks. Yeah. How was there any logistics that you needed to work out before you even got there? Because is driving in Mexico a big deal for Americans? Um, no, it's not. Uh, I had done the same thing last year, so it was was no big deal at all. Um, there's travel warnings um, for a number of different places, but uh, in Mexico right now for Americans. But um, I guess I was, really wasn't too worried about anything there. I never felt unsafe, and you know, I picked a hotel that was right off of uh, the highway, and it was really one one road. It, you get on the highway in Merida, and it drives you straight to Campeche. So. Uh, it was actually really an easy travel. I listened to a book on tape the entire time and just kind of was able to shut off and, and just, you know, if the signs weren't in Spanish, you would have, wouldn't have known that you were in another country. Wow. So it's just you traveling alone this year? Yep. Yep. Um, my wife goes to Fulls typically. It's just too expensive to and too much time off of work to, for her to go to 70.3s, especially international ones. Right. So you get there. How was the check-in process for your condo? Or you said a hotel, right? Uh, I, I stayed at a place, I guess it would be considered a bed and breakfast, but it had like two bedrooms and, uh, yeah, uh, or two, I guess, rooms that they rented out or maybe a couple more upstairs. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I think it was about $25 a night. Um, wow. so yeah, um, it was in the city center. Um, I guess I didn't know too much about, uh, what I was getting myself into at that price, but, um, the sheets were clean and they had towels and a shower. So it met my needs. All right. So you get to the race on Friday to check in. How is it checking in as a pro? Uh, this one, it, you just, usually there's a pro table. Uh, this race there wasn't, so they just had bib numbers at each table. So, I mean, it was a pretty standard check-in process. Everybody there uh, spoke English, which made it easy, or at least one person at every table did. Um, so, again, really, it was just like any other race checking in um, where you, I, I think it took me about five minutes to get checked in and through um, all the lines that you need to get to, you know, you check in, you get your bib number, and then you go over and get your um, – uh, chip and then they give you a bag and then you have to walk through the iron man store they they tend to set it up so everybody has to walk through there um no matter what and then out you go wow so was that an easy venue for you to actually or was it a nice venue rather oh yeah the the where they had the check-in it, it was a um a civic center of some sort so yeah i mean the the both it was a two transition race um and both transitions they had a country club and a civic center so they're both really nice and all good so you had to go and drop your bike off at one place and then all your run stuff at run stuff off at the other one correct yep now and you did that race morning or you did that no we before? had to do that the day before um again typically they let pros bring their bikes race morning but um, there was not really anything for parking up at the transition or at the first transition. So everybody had to take a shuttle. Uh, so we had to bring our bikes in the day before. Um, so we had the pro meeting on Saturday morning, um, at about nine 30, I believe usually it's noon, um, between 11 and one, but this time it was nine 30. Uh, so then I dropped everything off at, at uh, T T2 since it was right there and then um, drove my bike out to T1, went for a quick ride and a swim, and, and then dropped my bike off there. Okay. So at the pro meetings, what did they put out there? Uh, it's pretty much the same as the athlete briefing for the amateurs. Uh, it's just different rules um, sometimes or, or – um, I mean, not, I guess not really there are only different rules is the water temperature, I guess, for the most part. But, um, you know, we don't we all start at the same time, so they don't need to talk about the rolling swim start or, or the wave start or anything like that. So it, it's just the I mean, really, it's the same information. I think they use the exact same PowerPoint as they did for the the um, amateur race briefings. Um, it was just uh you know, specific to how we specifically are going to start times, 
Um, and then, you know, things to look out for. They just talk about the course, talk about, um, you know, what to expect on race day. Okay. So the day before the race, did you have like a certain meals that you wanted to try to eat before the race? Um, I don't really worry too much about it for breakfast or, or lunch. As long as I get food that, you know, I would normally eat, I, I don't get too bothered by that. And then the night before I ch- typically always do, um, chicken and rice. And that was easy to find. There was a couple of American restaurants there, um, that I stuck to before the race anyways. Um, just because I had ate there before at that restaurant knew what they had and knew they'd be safe. So, um, yeah, had no problem finding that. And then, um, yeah, that was, I went to dinner around five o'clock. I purposely went early because I wanted to avoid the crowd and get out of there as quick as I could and get back to the hotel and just get off my feet. Nice. So you get back to your hotel, go to bed pretty early. How much sleep did you get? Uh, I typically don't go early to bed early. Um, I, I actually stay up a bit later on race night than uh, normal. And I do that on purpose because I find that if I go to bed early, I just stress or I end up thinking too much about the race. If I go to bed at a semi-normal time when my body is used to falling asleep, I'm able to fall asleep faster. Um, and, and like, if you don't fall asleep in the first 10 minutes or 20 minutes, I'm not going to fall asleep. I just sit there and think all night. So, um, if I go to a bed at a normal time, then I tend to be able to fall asleep and sleep better. So that's, that's kind of what I've always done for a race. Okay. So how much sleep did you get? Uh, I went to bed around 10, 15. I ended up waking up at four. Okay. Now, do you have a certain breakfast you like to get before the race? Yeah, I always do two servings of first endurance alterogen, which is actually a recovery drink um first the first endurance recovery drink but um i think it uh, works really well for me i typically do all fluids on race day until after the race so that's for me that's 700 calories i take it 300 or three hours before the race and i've never had an issue with any gi stuff during the race or anything like that so it just it works my ideal way of of doing things is i want to get to the start line of the race feeling hungry but knowing that i'm not so um i want my stomach to be empty but my tanks to be full okay and and this way is has um, been able to do that for me okay so you get up on race morning you have your shake that you do and then you get to transition now are you making sure that your tires are pumped up to a, a psi or what are you doing in transition I actually had to change my tire and tra- or tra- my tube and transition the day before. Um, I went out for a ride and I gave my I about three minutes into the ride, um, someone else got a flat and they didn't have a kit, so I gave my flat kit to them. And then about on my way back, I had five miles to left to go, and <laughs> I get a flat. And um, so I'm five miles away and I'm walking my bike back to uh to the transition area and thankfully somebody uh pulled over and i rode in the back of their truck um all the way back to to transition um so i had to change my tire or my the tube on on race morning and yeah i mean it's just get there make sure everything your your tires in the right or your tires are pumped up the way you want them your gear is it the way you want it um this race actually um, the mount line was up a fairly steep incline. So, you know, you wanted to make sure it was in a pretty easy gear right away. Otherwise you'd, people were just kind of falling over. I heard that didn't shift their bike down enough. So that's something to always pay attention to, obviously. Uh, and then making sure your nutrition's on the bike, the computer's set up and ready to go. Um, I turn my computer on and then put it on auto stop or auto pause. So, you know, if it's not sensing that it's moving, then uh, you don't have to, or then it just automatically pauses. So once you get going, you don't have to worry about fiddling with the computer. It just automatically starts as soon as you start moving. And you use the Garmin 1000? Um, I typically don't. I did this race. I typically use the 520, but my 520 decided to not turn on at all. Actually, I'll be switching to the Polar Bike um, computer uh, for the next race, I finally got the the court with Bluetooth, so I'll be using all Polar products moving forward. Wow. 
So you get all that set up. How much PSI did you use on race day for this race? Um, I put 95 in the front, 97 in the back, typically. Okay. Is there a reason for that? Yep, because that's what's fastest. <laughs> I ride on 95 because it's a little bit softer. I mean, I've heard people riding up to 120. It's just yeah, it depends on what tires, what wheels. There's a lot of factors that'll that'll play into that. I mean, a lot of people will put tubulars up higher um, in the 120 range, especially. You know, some people just have no rhyme or reason. They just do you know think that more is better, or harder is faster. I like to go with the 95 and 97. So you get everything squared away in transition. You head down to the swim start. What does that look like for you? Um, the swim start in Campeche is a beach start, which I typically don't like. But So we have maybe a 20-yard uh, run into the water. We had plenty of time to warm up, which a lot of races don't have. Um, they had a nice warm-up area set off uh, or set up for us, and so we, you know, we could warm up as long as we want. And then uh, we went to the start line. They called uh, everybody off and then um, gave us like a one-minute warning. And then all of a sudden, uh, the gun went off. No, Not many people were ready for it, myself included. So it was a bit of a chaos. A couple people tripped over the uh, starting line, which ironically enough was caution tape. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, a few people tripped on that running in but you know eventually everything kind of got squared away this swim was a wetsuit legal swim or no it was not it was warm no it was swim skin okay so was the water pretty good there um yeah it was actually quite calm last year i remembered it being a little bit choppier but it was clear uh for especially clear for the gulf of mexico it was it was protected and and rather calm it was it was yeah not a anything to really concern yourself with with the swim now did you use clear goggles for this race? I did not. I used um, the tinted Volair uh, goggles by Zone 3. Um, we were swimming straight into the sun for the, after the first turn, um, and it was a clear day, so tinted goggles were definitely the route to go. So was the swim pretty? Could you see the bottom of the lake? Um, I guess I have no idea. <laughs> I don't really pay attention to what is under me. I try to look forward at feet when I swim, so... Um, I I could see my hands and I could see the people's feet in front of me, so the water was at least clear enough for that. I don't really know how how at what point you could see the bottom and and what you couldn't. I, I I guess I don't pay too much attention to that. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, that's a terrible answer, but <laughs> hey, no worries. So you get ready to get out of the swim. Is there any type of technique that you use to kind of prep your body to that to know that you're about to get out of the water, like start kicking more or anything like that? No, um, I definitely wouldn't kick more. Uh, you know, when you when you go from lying or basically being prone to being vertical, your heart rate is going to spike. That's going to be the typically transition one is the point where the heart rate is the highest. So kicking would would probably just raise that a bit more. Uh, I mean, I guess I'm uh, kicking harder. I guess I, I kick through the entire swim. So uh, I just basically you know, it depends on on the the layout to the land this one was pretty pretty flat um or was pretty uh consistent coming out so you didn't have to worry about like dolphin dives or, or ducking uh any crashing waves or anything like that so it was not a technical swim exit so you could just get out and run through transition no problem the the run to transition was was really short easy to get to your bike and easy to get out out of transition and this is a grass transition, right? Yeah, it was actually like a, a, a soccer practice field, so it was really nice. I mean, you ran to the beach straight to the soccer practice field, and, and then it w I think you had to go up a couple steps or something. But, yeah, it was really a, a smooth and nice transition area. Now, is there any thing that you did to get the sand off your feet in transition? No. Um, the... There were some hours set up, I think, for age or for people if you wanted to run through them, but I just didn't worry about that too much. Okay. Did you have any issues with the sand at all? No, no. Um, I I put um, I use Ruby's Loop, um, so I put that on my feet before the swim started. I guess I never remembered thinking anything about uh, any sand at, at all at any point. 
Okay. So you get out on the bike. How was that the first few miles? Um, the first few miles of the bike are probably the, the hardest of, of the whole day. Um, just I, Really, it's the first two. You're going uphill trying to sort out getting into your shoes and everything. And the hill is a pretty decent climb. It's not long. It's just a pretty decent climb uh, in terms of incline. And then that goes down. Um, so then you have a pretty decent descent. And I wasn't uh, totally buckled in to the shoes. Um, I was inside them, no problem by that time, but I wasn't um, snapped in tight. So I took the descent pretty conservatively. Um, and at the bottom, there's some cobbles. Um, and then you go through a roundabout on cobbles and um, – uh, you know, again, that's it's too early at the uh, in the race for me to try to do something stupid in that area. So I, again, I was pretty conservative on on uh, at least till I got to the actual road. And then once you're on the road, you, you um, really just settle in onto the highway for the entire ride. Uh, it's two out and back loops, um, rolling hills the entire time. It looks on pa- on paper, it looks pretty flat. It's definitely not. It looks, again, if you were to look at it on paper, it would look like a really easy bike course. Um, but the, there's the rolling hills, and then there's it was quite windy, and, and um, it would go from protected to unprotected. So there were a bunch of gusts that would come through, and, and um, oftentimes there was at the bottom of the hill when you were at your highest speeds. Um, so uh, pretty much everybody that I talked to said that they found it hard to just settle in. They couldn't ever just get into a rhythm and go. It was sometimes, you know, you felt great. And then other times you just felt awful and like you were fighting the entire time. So with the wind, what type of wheels were you using? I used the zip 858 front and the disc on the back. Um, that's, I would use that combo most every race, um, Typically, with a headwind or a tailwind, there's no issues. But with the crosswinds, um, you know, I did find that there were times where uh, maybe a little bit of a shallower front wheel would have been um, the better option. But, you know, overall, I do think it was the fastest wheel set uh, for the course. Okay. How were the road qualities on this course? The road qualities were great. Um, the only thing that I didn't really like about it were um, – a couple speed bumps in the last few miles leading back into town and a couple of them being on a pretty steep down or downhill. Um, so you had to either bunny hop them, which I wasn't going to do, um, or slow down quite a bit to go over the bumps. Right. And these are the short, thick bumps, not the big long humps, right? They had both. Oh, both. Yeah. Yep, depending on where you were. They had some that were like a bump up onto a crosswalk, and then you go down, and then they had some of the short little ones as well. Well, and you can't really go around them? No. Well, because I know in Galveston, you have some of the big ones, or big long ones, rather, right at yeah. the very beginning before you get on the main road, but then yep. after you're good. What kind of calories were you trying to hit every hour? Um, yeah, I use first, first endurance nutrition. Um, I use typically... I race with the FS Pro um, as my only calorie source. I've been playing around a little bit with adding a little bit of liquid shot in with that, which is their um, version of, of gels, um, I guess. And so um, I, I'm shooting for 500 calories an hour, um, typically. This race I fell a little bit short, um, but that was because I was more focused on getting water in as well um, because of the heat. How hot was it? Uh, it started out as a fairly pleasant day. It was like 82, but I think it hit 96 or 97 at the end of the day. Wow. And it's obviously humid, um, because of where we're at. So it was definitely a hot day. Nice. So now before we go much further, did you put any chamois cream on before the bike ride? Not in transition. I do that all before the swim. Okay. I actually use a short sleeve kit. Is that the same type of kit you use? Yep. I, um, I've been working with Ownway here for two, this is my second year. Um, and I've used their short sleeve kit, um, both all for all, most of the races every now and then I'll bring, uh, the sleeveless out. Um, but yeah, most of the time I'm going to go with sleeves for most people. It's faster. 
Um, it just depends on the cut of the kit uh, and, then, and then how it fits on the individual. But most of the time, it's going to be faster. Okay. So you get off the bike. How was T2 for you? I know it was pretty quick. Um, yeah, T2 is fine. Uh, it's, it's all carpeted. It's in the parking lot of the convention center, I believe. It's carpeted, and you just run through, throw on your shoes, and then, um, yeah, try to get out of there as fast as you can. Did you have an idea of where you were in the standings at this point? Well, I could count the bikes that were in transition, so I um, I think I was in eighth off the bike, um, which wasn't where I wanted to be, but um, it was uh, better than where I came out of the water. So that's at least I was going in the right direction. Um, I had no real clue where anybody else was at. I rode pretty much or most of the ride by myself. Um, so I knew what place I was in, but I didn't really know what exactly was happening in the race in front of me. So you couldn't really see anybody in front of you for most of the bike ride? No, no. And the second loop, it's a two loop course. And so the second loop is all, you know, you're dodging age groupers um, the entire time. So, you know, you can't really see somebody up the road and know if they're uh, age grouper or pro when you, know, you, you just have no way of telling. Okay. So you get off on the run did you put on socks before the run or you just run sockless? Uh, no, I, I always wear socks. I wear the compress sport, um, socks and cap sleeves for the run. Okay. Get in there and you put on your, your own shoes on running. Okay. Yep. How do you like those? Yeah. I use the, I raced the halves in the cloud flash. Um, I raced a full in them as well. Um, I don't really know what I'm going to use for Ironman Texas yet. Um, but the plan at this point, at least, is to probably use the flash as well. Okay. So you get on the run. How were the first few miles on the run? Um, I felt fine. Uh, I the first mile always feels pretty poor, but I'm always going too fast. I, I typically try not to look at my watch in the first mile and just let my body settle into a pace and. Uh, most of the time it ends up being one of my faster miles and I, at the mile marker, I have to draw back a little bit. Uh, that was, I, I think that was pretty much the case. This one, um, it was the fastest of the day, but I didn't draw back cause I thought I'd be able to hold that the entire day. Um, but the heat ended up, um, beating me up a little bit. So I think I backed off about, uh, ended up backing off about 10 seconds per mile throughout the, the race and and um so i started out in the 530 range and ended up averaging 540s wow that's freaking fast man yeah it was not one of my better runs um but you know again it was still the fastest run of the day there um you always have to consider the the heat when when you look at your overall times uh but you know it's always a bit frustrating to run a couple minutes faster the year before the race than you did the next year but I biked and swam quite a bit faster. So all in all, it was a faster day. So perspective. Yes. So now you get on the run. Are you using on-course nutrition or are you still using your first endurance? Um, usually I have a, a flask of the EFS liquid shot. Um, I didn't take that along this time. Uh, and that was only because there is an aid station every kilometer instead of every mile. So you were getting 21 aid stations or 20 aid stations on the run for a half marathon that, yeah, you, you can survive on that. Um, so yeah, I, I survived off of on course, um, for this race. Wow. I mean, that is a lot of freaking aid stations. It is. Um, it, it makes it easier to break the run up though. Um, so it does make it feel longer because you're just going through aid stations all the time, you know, and you, you get used to like, you usually have 10 or 11 aid stations in an, in a normal half iron man. And so you get through the 10th one and you're only halfway in this, this time. And usually you're almost done in, in a normal race. Um, but with as hot as it was, it was definitely nice because, uh, the, the, you could focus more on, on getting your, trying to cool yourself down through the aid stations rather than, than, getting enough calories in um because you you had a shot at calories 
about twice as often. Nice. So were you trying to hit a certain split or did you have a certain race plan in mind going into it or was it just going all out for the entire run? I typically don't plan for time. I, I, uh, I think that's a great way to explode is if you try to run a certain time because um, you don't know what it's going to feel like, what the weather is going to do. If it's hot and windy and you try to run the same speed as if it's cold and rainy, uh, then you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, I just try to keep moving forward, um, you know, progress within the race and work on trying to pass one person at a time. Okay. So I think you've passed, what, three people on the run? Uh, yeah, I guess I moved from eighth to fifth. Okay. So for the run, were you going off of RPE more than anything else? Yeah. I mean, I, I have, uh, my polar, um, watch that I use. Um, but I really don't use that to base my pace off of. I use it to learn off of after the race, if that makes sense. What do you mean learn off of? You can learn a lot of, about, uh, how a race went, by looking at your data after the race. Um, that's, you know, I try to race off of field, but then learn off of that. Um, as I talk through the race with the coach, with my coaches after the fact, and if you, you have your heart rate and paces in front of you and you can talk through how you were feeling at certain times and, you know, see how that matches up with what was happening in the, uh, quantitative data that you have to look at. Um, you can learn a lot about, uh, pacing and, and help yourself make better decisions for the next time around. Okay. So you mentioned talking about the data with your coaches. Who are your coaches? Okay. I work with Matt Botchwell and Julie Divins. Um, I've worked with Julie since 2016, and I brought Matt on board um, to help specifically with the bike uh, over the winter. So I think we officially started in December. Uh, Julie and Matt work great together. Um, and it's, it's really worked well. Um, we've made a lot of progress, uh, especially in this last off season. Um, and I'm really excited with, with, uh, where my fitness is at right now. And, and I really think that that's going to show up in the April races that I have coming up. Good. So how hard is it to be training in Iowa where it's really cold and going down to a race where it's pretty hot? How did you tackle that? Um, I didn't well, <laughs> that was definitely, I, what, uh, you know, I, what kind of hurt me a bit, um, on the bike and the run. Um, I think, uh, I did the best I could under, under the circumstances. Uh, last year I did a training camp in Kona in February and that helped me prep for the race. Um, so I think I was a little bit better heat acclimated last year than I was this year. This year we did our training camp in Tucson, which was a lot cheaper. Uh, but it obviously was, was not, uh, as warm. And, um, so, you know, and when I'm at home, I'm primarily working out in my garage, uh, which is not that, uh, warm either. Uh, I do have a sauna protocol that I've done for a number of years that, um, has helped, a little bit, but it was just a, a very big jump from going to typically working out in a 40 degree garage to being in a 95 degree heat, trying to run as hard as you can. Oh, so the train going into this race, were you just training straight through this race or did you taper for this at all? Uh, well, there's always a little bit of a taper built in when you have, you know, a 20 hour travel day. Um, you obviously get a day off. I don't take many days completely off. And so, uh, when you have that, you, you have a day off and then obviously, um, there's not much you can do, uh, with one or two days, um, leading into a race. And so, you know, I, I would say, um, you know, Wednesday for me was a pretty solid workout day and then Thursday I traveled and then Friday was, and Saturday were just kind of, uh, rust busting workouts and to prime the pump for, for a race. So, you know, I would say a two or three day taper would be. Uh, what we did, that's it, 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 people, I, I don't think a lot of people understand how much different that the taper process is quote unquote for a pro as it is for an age grouper. Um, you know, age, most age groupers going into a full or a half, they're, they're racing, you know, only a couple of times. Uh, you, you really only get to, I, I think that you can really only do two full builds, um, 
a year, maybe three, if you do things really, really well. Um, so, you know, the, you're not fully tapering more than, you know, two to three times a year. Um, and for me, that's going to be Ironman Texas and Kona, hopefully. Okay. So how many hours were you maxing out your training going into this race? Honestly, I have no idea. I don't pay any attention to that. I let coach Julie and coach Matt sort all that out. Um, (laughs) I, you know, people ask me that all the time and I honestly have no idea. I just do what I'm told. Um, you know, I do a lot of coaching on my own and I know what my, the athletes that I'm working with, what their hours are. But, um, for me, um, you know, ever since I switched to, to coach Julie, um, at that point in, in time, I needed, uh, something different. Uh, I just needed, uh, to not think about triathlon 24 seven. So I've been able to really, um, wake up, look at my training for the day, train, get my coaching stuff done and then kind of shut off and spend time with my wife and walk my dogs and and just enjoy things a little bit more. Um, and so I don't typically look at what I have tomorrow. I look at what my day, uh, you know, I look at, um, the night before I say, okay, what time do I have to go swim in the morning? Cause I only, I, if I have an over an hour swim, I have to do it at 6am. If I have an hour swim, I can do it at noon. Um, but that's all I look at. Um, you know, I obviously have quite a bit of flexibility in my day. Um, so really I plan my day out in the morning, um, which is atypical, but I think that helps me just worry about one day at a time and stay in the moment and stay present for workouts. If you, if you're going through a workout wondering about, or, you know, if you're stressing on Saturday about a workout that you have next Saturday, I just don't think that's a good mindset to be in. Um, you know, and again, like, since this is my job, um, I can just, set off the time that everybody else has for their job. And that's my time for training. And so, you know, coach, um, just tell, you know, tells me what I have to do, um, that day. And I structure that day and then worry about everything else later. Now, was it hard for you to get into that level of trust with her? No, there's a few things that were hard to buy into, but that's what I wanted when I was looking for a coach. And so, um, I had gone out and met with her and trained with her and knew, uh, knew that she had a few of the specific qualities that I wanted in the coach. I knew she would help me with my swim and I knew that, um, she would help me, uh, race like a pro she'd done it. She's a world champion. Um, and you know, I think that it, with my background, I could easily structure my own training, um, without, too much issue. Um, but I like being able to just not think about anything beyond executing workouts. And, um, Julie and Matt both know that that's the way that, that I work, uh, best right now that might change at some point, you know, that mindset might change at some point, but that's what I've been finding success with and been enjoying a lot more. Um, so that's what works. Nice. I know for me, I just look at the day to day as well. I mean, I look at the bigger picture at times, but it's most of the time, all right, what do I do today? Okay, cool. Just knock it out. Pretty simple. Because I coach as well, and I know more about my athletes' plans than I do about my own plan, and it seems like that's the same thing for you. Yeah, I mean, and and everybody's a little bit different. You know, most, most age groupers have to plan their week out. Uh, around kids around their other you know their real job and and you know i certainly get that um but you know it's it's hard sometimes for me even as a coach to like you know somebody is stressing out about a workout that i've given them you know because i i give them a couple weeks in advance and they're worried about a work that the workout that they have in two weeks and i'm like well just worry about what you have to accomplish between now and that you know we're, you know, I really think that the best way to get it, or to go is to worry about one interval at a time, not about how much you have left to do. Or, you know, if you just focus on one interval at a time and get through that interval, um, that helps you stay present. You know, you can always do one more, right? And so if you have a workout that, you know, is, is really quite difficult for you, it's just always about just making one interval at a time. And, and um, you know, if you're worried about something you have two weeks down the road, it's hard to stay focused on that one interval that you're doing at that point in time. Right. <clears throat> Completely agree. So we didn't really talk about the finish line much. So you finished fifth, had a solid run of an hour and 15 minutes, really great run. 
I've never ran one that fast. <laughs> I'm like 25 minutes behind you at my fastest. So you had a great run. How was the finish line process for you? Uh, the finish line was a little bit frustrating for me uh, because the guy that got fourth, I think I took, I put three minutes into him um, by the 5K turnaround or the last 5K turnaround. So over the first 15 or so K, I had made up three minutes and he was about 40 seconds in front of me. And so I thought that I, sh you know, I, I really had a good shot at, uh, at catching him and um, I just didn't. And, and so that was, I was frustrated with myself on that one. Uh, I got to the last two miles where normally I would be able to, you know, be able to have another gear to go to. And uh, my body just wasn't letting me do that uh, on the day or my mind wasn't letting me do that on the day. I haven't really decided which one was the limiting factor yet. Um, but it, it uh, yeah, so I, I really thought that, um, you know, I wasn't really happy that I, whether I catch him or not, that, you know, that, that's racing, but just that I wasn't able to put out a better effort to do that. Um, I, you know, I had worked so hard to cut, you know, so much time into them and, and then, and not, you know, to not make it closer or to not make it a, at least a interesting finish, um, for both of us was a little bit frustrating on my part. Um, you know, but overall, like the logistically, the finish line was simple. You, you cross the finish line, you walk through, they had water and Gatorade right away. And then the athlete food and, uh, massage, uh, place afterwards. The, the, one of the best parts of being a, a pro is when, you finish earlier the people have been you know the people in the massage tent have been standing around for a half hour waiting to do something so uh you typically get a little bit of longer than the 10 minutes that that uh you know they promise everybody that um is coming through when you know hundreds of people are finishing at a time All right so do you have a first endurance recovery drink you use for after the race or do you instantly go to solid food uh Depends on how I feel. Uh, usually I try to get to solid foods as soon as I can. Um, you know, for a half, that's, I can usually do that after the race. Um, for a full, I, I typically can't. I, I do pack um, first endurance Ultragen in my morning clothes bag, but the way this was set up, we couldn't get to that right away. Um, and so um, – I couldn't get to my morning clothes bag for an hour or so after the race. So I just had, uh, what they had available for us. Okay. And you had to stay around the race until what time? Um, I think I finished around 1145 and, and, um, I got back, I had checked out of my hotel, but I got back to a friend's hotel and showered there before driving back to Merida. I think I got there at like one thirty, So it really wasn't that much time at all. And I, and that, time period i was able to collect my bike get it all loaded in the car and uh drive over to that hotel um so it was it wasn't that bad at all so you already were showered had your bike back at your place by the time the later portions of the race were even finishing yeah yeah <laughs> that's just crazy so now did you have like a set of boots that you were using to help you recover afterwards um, I didn't travel with the uh, Norma Texas race. Um, I will to the Texas race cause I'm driving. Um, but yeah, for this one, it was such a short trip. Um, uh, you know, I was only gone for a total of four days. Uh, so I, I just didn't, uh, didn't bring them along with me this time. Ah. And you use Norma Tex, is that right? Yeah. Yep. Most of the time they have a, a booth at all the U S races. So, um, you know, I'll have a set at home, but if I, you know, if I were to do a, if I were to fly to a 70.3 and, and, uh, do another fast one, I would just jump in the, the booth that they have there at the expo. Gotcha. So what's next for you? Uh, I will head down to Galveston on, I'll probably drive down at least to the woodlands on April 3rd. And then I will race Galveston on the 8th. I probably won't go down to Galveston until the 7th, just in time for the pro meeting. Uh, that course isn't very technical at all. Um, you know, it's pretty much a flat out and back. It's going to be windy. Um, you know, for us, it might not be a wetsuit swim for the 
for the pros. I'm guessing it will be for the age groupers, though. Um, you know, so there's really not much of the course that you have to check out. The run is a three loop, seventy point three run. So, you know, third loop is pretty full, <laughs> um, and there's about a hundred turns every loop. So <laughs> that part is always interesting, but um, you know, it's flat. So. Um, yeah, so I won't need to check too much of that out. So I'll make that a two-day trip and then head back to the woodlands and stay in the woodlands all the way through um, through Ironman, Texas. Nice. Well, if athletes want to follow you, where can they follow you at? Uh, yeah, in, I make it easy. All Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are just at Matt Hansen Try. Um, and then I also have all the same for Matt Hansen Coaching as well. Okay. And you have your own website, which is MattHansonCoaching.com? Yeah, that's my coaching one. And then I have uh, MattHansonTry.com for my racing stuff. Okay, cool. So you're doing Galveston, then Ironman, Texas. Are you doing anything else this year besides hopefully Kona? Yeah, obviously I'll, I'll race quite a bit more than that. I don't have anything set in stone. Um, a lot, you know, Everything depends on how Ironman Texas goes for what I do this year. Uh, ideally, I would go to Galveston, or sorry, I would go to Chattanooga in May um, and then do Coeur d'Alene 70.3 in June uh, and then take a little bit of a break over the summer uh, for just to – get unfit a little bit so I can build up stronger, hopefully leading into Kona. Um, I would look at doing either steelhead or um, possibly a later 70.3 leading into Kona as well, just to have a way to knock the rust loose during that time period as well. Okay. Well, I would like to have you back going after you do Galveston for sure, because I'll be that race and I'll actually be at Ironman Texas volunteering there in transition. So I'll be able to see you run through real quick. Sounds good. Hopefully it's real quick. We'll see. <laughs> it should be. I don't see why it wouldn't. Well, that's all the questions I have. If, if someone were to do this race in the future, what advice would you give them for this particular race? Um, definitely uh, have be ready for the heat. Um, it, be comfortable driving and driving down there. I, I do think with the two transitions, there, there are shuttles and, and you can fly into Campeche. It's, it's a lot more expensive to fly into Campeche. Um, for me, it was like a thousand dollars cheaper to fly to Merida than it was to fly to Campeche. Um, it's a, it's a actually a, a small town. It's, it's, there's some fun places in there as well. Um, so, you know, if you do have the luxury of staying a little bit and, uh, touring around i think that a day or two there is would be would be nice um don't expect the bike to be flat um uh, be prepared for the wind and uh you know the wind is pretty brutal on the bike but it it saves you a little bit on the run because uh it it can get it cools you down a bit especially after you pour some water on yourself so nice so one more question what's your definition of a perfect race Perfect race would be um, crossing the finish line feeling like you gave it your all. Uh, I don't think you can plan out a race every step of the way, and there's thousands of decisions that need to be made um, throughout the day. And you know you can make most of them right, but you're always going to make a few of them wrong. But if you cross the finish line and you feel like you had nothing left in the tank, then that's that's all you can ask for. Wow, you sound like John Wooden. All right, Matt. Well, thank you so much for your time today and your insight on Ironman 70.3 Campache. I hope I'm saying that right, even though I don't think I am. Uh, Campache, however you say it. Uh, I look forward to following you in Gallison, literally, and then I'll be tracking you in Houston at the full Ironman in Texas. And I wish you the best of luck at both races, and hopefully we can have you back on after those races. All right. Thank you very much. All right. You have a great day, okay? Yeah, you too. Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in today. If you were able to learn something from today's episode, take a minute to leave us a review over on iTunes or share it with a friend. This will help us share it with even more athletes. If you'd like to learn more about who I am and what I do, check out my website at CoachTerryWilson.com where you can find the rest of the episodes of this podcast as well. Until next time, continue the pursuit.